G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle. No Legion is more misunderstood upon the tabletop than the Raven Guard. Strong units and a seemingly purpose-built Legion trait designed to multitask has led to them being perceived as a strong Legion by some. Today I want to dive into this, the latest episode in this series on the Legions, and one which challenges how we read the rules and compares apples to apples. How do other Legions do the job better? The biggest test I like to administer is one of broad and repeatable rules, as these tend to be the most powerful in the game, and it takes something truly astounding to outclass a rule like Brutal, which merely has to be triggered by causing a wound, versus something like Shock Pulse, which requires you to hit, penetrate a vehicle, and then do insufficient damage to destroy it, but not stun it. At least it works as super heavies, I guess. Now, I've previously covered the Salamanders, the Thousand Suns, and also the Imperial Fists in this series. The Thousand Suns was unique because that was a rewrite of their rules, whereas with the Imperial Fists and the Salamanders, it was a look at the Legion rules. So you could almost see these as a counterpoint to the Getting Started in Horus Heresy series. Now... As per the usual rundown, we're going to talk about Legion traits, then we're going to move into Warlord traits. After that, we'll go into the Advanced Reaction, the Legion War Gear, the Legion Elite or Specialist Units, and then we go into the Rites of War, and finally we'll finish it off with a set of the Special Characters and a summary on how it all ties together to create the whole package. Now, with the Raven Guard, their Legion trait, broad, repeatable, is not what I would define it as. See, the Raven Guard Shadow and Fury Legion trait is deceptive, as it appears to apply army-wide. But when you actually read the rules, the fine print, you realise that it's completely contradictory writing, and it shatters the illusion. It breaks down into three parts. The Talons. This confers to infantry without the heavy subtype, any kind of jump pack. There's Warhawk and Corvid available to the Raven Guard, uh, and Tartarus Terminator Armour. Units comprised entirely of Talons gain the Infiltrate Special Rule and also Shrouded 6 plus as long as the enemy is more than 8 inches away. Falcons is designed for the larger units which are not vehicles, namely Dreadnoughts, Jump Pack Equipped Squads, Terminator Squads and any heavy infantry. Falcons reroll their wound rolls of a 1 after a successful charge, even if that charge was disordered. And the third is Hawks. This is the branch for cavalry, fast flyer vehicles, uh, any Hawks unit running, moving flat out or moving as a zooming flyer, gains the shrouded 6 plus rule or a boosted shrouded 5 plus rule if they already had shrouded 6 plus. And this effect lasts until the start of your next turn. Now you need to be very careful about crossing subtypes as war gear or special rules confer by models such as the heavy subtype or adding a boarding shield to a non-Tartarus Terminator armoured equipped independent character, it's a bit of a mouthful, will prevent the attached unit from gaining the talent's benefit. So don't put a console with a boarding shield into a tactical squad because the whole tactical squad loses the infiltrate and the six plus shrouded. What great writing. This is further muddied by the fact that nothing from the other subtype is conferred to their unit. It only is conferred to the possessing model. So if I took that heavy console that gets his reroll ones to wound in the round he charged in the close combat and join him to that tactical squad, not only did they lose infiltrate and shrouded, but they don't get his rerolling ones to wound either. The Talon's rule uh, is designed around aggressive assaults and you gaining the advantage but it rather strangely includes units like Breaches and Heavy Support Squads, because they have the Heavy Rule, which is bizarre, as they do not want to be assaulting the enemy and have no war gear designed for assaulting the enemy. I find this absurd, as they are the exact units which would gain the most from the ability to infiltrate to an advantageous position. Instead, the arguably weakest unit in the list, and the ones you normally use to hold backline objectives, Tactical Squads, are the ones who do all the infiltration closest to the enemy, usually has units which are primed for killing power armor in the front of their line. Additionally, the prevalence of augury scanners in 2.0 often means that you're unable to take advantage of your infiltration to the full effect as you cannot get within that 18 inch bubble preventing the infiltration from occurring. The Falcon's rule 
really comes into its own for two units, and only two units. Terminators and Melee Dreadnoughts, who both gain the rerolling one's bonus to wound on their strength 8 plus mega death weapons. However, I do want to point out that those weapons require you to strike last, in the case of the Terminators, and you still must pull off the charge for any bonus to actually occur in the first place. That means that it's hard to make happen because Terminators are slow. I'll come back to this rule momentarily, as all three Shadow and Fury abilities have a fatal flaw. Now, I'll ask you, the audience, a question right now, and that is, what units symbolise the Raven Guard the most? And when you think World Eaters, you think Chain Axe Infantry. That's what comes to mind. When you think Salamanders, it's Flamers. And for the Dark Angels, it's brooding squads of Deathwing Terminators and Raven Wing Bikes. For the Raven Guard, I picture... Recon Marines, Scouts, Assault Marines, Land Speeders, those kind of units. And every codex we've had going back over 30 years has pushed those units in bulk and written rules for them. So how do these rules confer to said units? Well, let's see. Their Recon Infantry already have Infiltrate, so the best they can hope for is the 6 plus Shrouded rule, if you don't think an Apothecary is a better investment for them. Uh, the Assault Marines, well, they all come with Shredding Chain Weapons or Lightning Cores, which reroll all to wound rolls, all of the time. They therefore would only gain a small bonus on their non-shredding weapons, such as the occasional Power Fist or Power Axe, something like that. If you know, you took one. Javelin Speeders, well, they're the most uh, beloved speeder in the game, uh, but they're cavalry. That's good, but they're heavy, which means that they cannot run, and therefore they don't benefit from the shrouding rule. Uh, and your bikes and jet bikes, well, they already get shrouded 5 plus from running, and they can't further improve it. And, well, of those categorically proven that the Legion trait confers essentially zero benefit to the bulk of the Legion, except in the most incidental of situations. Your Assault Marines, in a renowned aggressive Assault Marine Legion, are no better at it than stock Assault Marines from other Legions. In fact, they may even be worse, as at least Legions like the Dark Angels gain a hit bonus on their swords. So how could it be that a Legion trait is written to be wide-ranging and all-encompassing, but the only two units in the entire list which seem to truly benefit from it are Dreadnoughts and Terminators, in a Legion that is known for their use of high-speed units and infiltration tactics. Without doubt, this is one of the worst written rules in the game. Warlord Traits. Versatile, repeatable, and viable. Viability is down to the ability uh, granted to the model and its unit being worth the trade-off of another unit doing the same job better or putting that model elsewhere in... Uh, with another ability perhaps for greater effect. For example, if you spend say 150 points on a Praetor only to attach you to a backline unit for a situational buff, that might not be the wisest use of their expensive abilities and their loss elsewhere on the battlefield may hurt you. So the first one up is the Bane of Tyrants, which is a loyalist only trait. It gives you plus one strength and plus one attacks when fighting at a challenge, or plus two if that challenge is against an enemy warlord. You may also make an additional reaction during the enemy's assault phase. Now, I think this is an okay ability, but do remember that many Praetors have ways of shutting you down. And when it comes to high-end dueling, the top legion Praetors, such as Emperor's Children, Dark Angels, or Special Characters, yeah, they will tear you limb from limb before you even get to land a blow, as they will hit you faster, or hit you easier, or both at the same time. The Bane of Tyrants is at its strongest in the smaller games, those kitted out units are less common. The Hidden Hand. You get to reroll all reserves whilst the Warlord is in reserves, and when the Warlord and his unit arrive on the battlefield, they gain the Fleet 2 special rule. It allows one extra reaction in the enemy's movement phase, and this one sounds good, but it doesn't really pass the viability test. Because if your warlord is in reserves, then he's not on the table. And if he's in reserves, was there something else you could use in his place to do the same job? And, well, as a fact, there is. Uh, 
there are other equally available units like the Damocles Command Tank, which is not the greatest unit in the world, but it does bring you all the reserve related shenanigans and would free up your commander to be both on the table and take another trait instead. Avoid this worthless warlord trait uh, unless you absolutely must take it. Lastly, no gods or masters, which is a traitor only trait. Now, whenever your warlord is in base-to-base -base contact with an infantry or cavalry model who has a higher weapon skill, strength, or initiative in their base profile, your warlord increases his weapon skill, strength, and initiative to match the enemy. Also, once per game, you may make a single free reaction without spending points, but it only applies to the warlord and his unit, majorly limiting its use. This is moderately solid trait, it's a bit strange in that it makes characters weirdly superhuman out of nowhere, and few people play Traitor Ravenguard. It's a deceptive trait for its utility as it goes off base profile, so not profiles that are being boosted by weapons such as Tyrannic Greatswords, and it has no effect outside of infantry or cavalry, so Primarchs, Dreadnoughts, Automata, Mechanized Unit subtypes, they will all grant zero bonus, making this trait a lot less useful than it initially seems. 2.0 tends to degrade stats rather than boosting them, so it won't be too often that you come across a character who has higher stats than your own, rather you'll simply lower yours with penalties in close combat. Best case, you have a thunder hammer and you're fighting custodes and your warlord is going to get her done. So. How do these compare against other legions? Well, poorly, very poorly. Situational bonuses, and they encourage or force you into fights against legions who have superior close combat potential. I think you'd be better served by just taking one of the universal warlord traits out of the main book. Advanced Reactions Titled Fade to Black, possibly after one of my favourite Metallica songs, um... Once per battle, when a friendly Legion of Astartes Raven Guard unit is targeted by a shooting attack, but before any dice are rolled, you get to make a move in inches equal to the highest initiative stat on the unit, and you gain Shrouded 4+. If you manage to get your unit out of range of the enemy, the enemy may choose a different target if possible. As vehicles have no initiative value, this does not affect them, and this is not a terrible reaction as it has no real downside beyond RNG and a bad roll. Uh, when you compare it to a bad reaction, such as Suicidal Salamander's one, it seems rather good, but when you compare it to something like the Ultramarines or Imperial Fist reactions, it comes up somewhat lacking. So if it's better than the worst, but worse than the best, that would make it some form of balanced middle zone. And better yet, everyone gets to have their cake and eat it too. The person opposite you still gets to pick a new target, and you didn't blow away a bunch of their stuff, and you pulled your guys out of danger. Neat. Legion War Gear. The Raven Guard have a weird assortment of war gear, and only a single weapon. The weapon is first up, and it's the Raven's Talons. Once the Mastercrafted Pinnacle of Lightning Cores, and now it's a slightly more rending version of Lightning Cores. Not as good as Phallic Blades on World Eaters, and the extra attack bonus is at least neat. It is it worth the 5 points over a normal Lightning Core per weapon, so 10 for 2? I don't really think so. Uh, but there is an edge case where I think it works really well, and that is having 2 to 3 Terminators with Lightning Cores in a 10-man unit armed with Thunder Hammers. They strike fast enough and can take down a lot of infantry at initiative, which is pretty useful sometimes. You don't want to encourage the Thunderhammer meta, but, well, that's Games Workshop's bad writing for you. The Improviser. It grants night vision at the cost of being extremely susceptible to blind tests. Last edition, it was mediocre, but since night fighting is everywhere this edition, and outside of point-blank shooting Gorgons at the face, blind is hard to find, I'd say pay the points and gain a bonus point of ballistic skill to boot. Fantastic piece of war gear in 2.0, and one of the best items for the Raven Guard, and possibly one of the best items in the game right now. Again, it's down to the fact that knife fighting is just so powerful in this edition. Camellia Line. It's a camo cloak. Sadly, not widely available enough to be really useful, and it grants a 6 plus shrouding, which can stack with things like the Talon Special Rule. It works best 
strangely, on a bike prey tool, as it can boost them to a 4 plus shrouding when they run. Don't ask me how, it's just more bad riding. Uh, one model gaining a plus one shrouding save is not worth 20 points, when things like the Imperial Fist gain a three plus invulnerable save for between 10 and 20 points. You always have to compare to other legions when it comes to buffs, and this one comes up wanting. Corvid Pattern Jump Pack. It's the Dark Fury Jump Pack, you know, the bigger Mark IV Jump Pack with the stylized wings. Yeah, now it grants extra movement, more reliable charges, and a special invulnerable save versus dangerous terrain tests. It also makes you slightly more bulky, which is handy versus Night Lord's outnumbering bonuses. Worth it for 10 points, I'd say yes, and when it's free on some units, even better. Just be careful though, because you will... You'll be pretty fat, pretty bulky. Bulky three on every model, but it's bulky 30 if you've got 10 guys. That's going to trigger Rampage on a lot of units. So keep that in the back of your mind if you go charging something like World Eaters. Legion Elites. After the disaster that is most everything up to this point, we finally reach the Legion Specialist units, and finally there is a light at the end of the tunnel. First, the more Dathan squad. Recon Marines with increased stats, such as Ballistic Skill, Extra Wounds, an interesting list of War Gear, which needs to be summarised as Volkites and Nemesis Bolters for best effect. Their special rule is called Fatal Strike, and it's one of those once-per-game sort of rules which give the entire squad a buff to their non-template, non-blast uh, ranged weapons, and it gives them Rending 4+. Useless on Nemesis Bolt Guns, obviously, which is why it's stupid to give them such a rule on a unit aimed at using and supplied with only that weapon in their resin kit. Hence my suggestion to use Volkites, because that's an ungodly amount of Blissy Skill 5, Strength 5, Rending 4 plus Death Loop Rate. Also, this confers to characters, so they can join in on the action too. Also, for a laugh, the entire uh, Legion Elite Recon unit is another victim of the Legion traits doing virtually nothing, as they already have Infiltrate. Dark Fury Squad. Now, these guys are elite assault marines with twin Raven's Talons that are taken as a fast attack choice. Dark Furies have Precision Strike 6+, plus and a bonus plus one initiative on the charge from Sudden Strike. Dark Furies also come equipped with the Corvid Pattern Jump Packs I just mentioned, which gives them excellent threat range, 14-inch moves, boosted survivability in dangerous terrain, and also gaining a plus 3 inches charge move. Their biggest flaw is the lack of Weapon Skill 5 in a Weapon Skill 5 meta game, meaning that they are best at dealing with Weapon Skill 4, and sadly in 2.0 there's not really an achievement in doing that. They do at least benefit, though, from the sheer number of attacks they can bring to bear, at least four each, and a chaplain will boost them to a really solid level. Somewhat offsetting the weapon skill issue beyond the chaplain is the fact that a unit of Dark Furies with exactly ten models may upgrade themselves to have three sergeant equivalents called Choosers of the Slain, who is weapon skill five, has boosted attacks, armor saves, and leadership stats. I have to note that this isn't one of those, you know, for every one in three guys you can add one. No, no, no. This is not like special weapons on the more day then. You must start with a full squad of 10, and then you can upgrade two more models to choosers of the slain for, you know, 15 points each. Another unit, ironically, which represents the Legion to their core, as most Legion specialist units in this game do, and of course, being Raven Guard, they gain zero benefit from their Legion trait, again, as their weapons reroll all to wound rolls already, making the rerolling ones on the charge rather redundant and totally pointless. Now a zero to one choice, and this is from the uh, PDF that gave us such wonderful hits as Alvarex Morn, who we'll get to. And this is the Deliverer's Squad. These guys are the mother low. They're a zero to one choice of deep striking weapon skill five cataphract terminators. Now you can take up to 15 of them. Don't know why 15. It seems like a random number, but it's 15. And they get access to a maximum of three multi melters, which I always suggest taking as they are a fantastic weapon on terminators for dealing with tanks or taking a few precious wounds off a dreadnought post charge or pre charge, I should say as well as killing enemy multi-wound models such as Cataphracti. 
They start off with power weapons of your choice and combi bolters, and you can dual wield Raven's Talons if you intend to make the most out of that weapon skill 5. Now, Deliverers have a allegiance-dependent bonus where traders gain hatred of Korax, uh, who they're never going to catch because they're slow-ass cataphractic terminates. And if they're loyalists, they get battle-hardened 1 which is infinitely better than Hatred Korax, but they can never deploy within 8 inches of Korax if he's on the field. Oh no! Anyway, he can never join them as well. And whilst the Fantastic Unit, and not typically Raven Guard, they do suffer from that 0 to 1 aspect more than most, as, well, there's nothing else that's in the Legion that is like them. They don't have the numbers on their own to win you the game outside of small points, and they're such a high threat unit because nothing else is like them, that they inevitably end up being massacred as priority one. Be very afraid of Huskulls. Oh, and this unit actually can make some use of the Legion trait. If you go for Chain Fists or Power Fists, then again, I did say they're not typically Raven Guard, and this goes to show it, as no actual Raven Guard will dare claim an actual bonus from their Legion trait. Legion Inductii. Although not an elite unit, they are at least a unique one, and with the Siege of Chthonia book, review coming soon, Raven Guard got Inductii Tacticals, because getting Raptors, who were actual Rapid Inductii, would be too hard for the rules writers. This unit replaces Heart of the Legion with Unchained Conviction, which prevents them from being pinned, and instead makes them move 7 inches away from the enemy, who causes the pinning test. The move stops at the edge of the table. If you were pinned while charging, the charge fails. Infiltrate them on, retreat them off, I guess. At last, at least, a unit which can make full use of the Legion traits, and it's the new guy with the learning disorder. Legion Rites of War. So, if the Legion Elite units were the light at the end of tunnel, well, it just got snuffed out, let me winks. Decapitation Strike. The benefits are, all Legion is the studies a Raven Guard, Gain the Shrouded 5 plus on a turn, they come in through a Deep Strike or Flanking Assault, and preferred enemy independent characters. You gain extra VPs for Slay the Warlord, granting you plus 2 VPs for Slay the Warlord if you manage to pull it off. Limitations may only include one heavy support choice and may not take fortifications. Now, this Rite of War was my go-to for Raven Guard in Heresy 1.0, as it combined Orbital Assault with Character Hunting Bonus, and moving a few choices like Deathstorm Drop Pods from Heavy Support into another slot, freeing up your Soul Heavy Support for something you really needed to bring, like a, oh, I don't know, Plasma Cannon Camo Cloaked Support Squad, which you would naturally infiltrate into the best position to freak your opponent out. In this edition, though, it's going up against Rites of War, which grant whole armies boosted saves on objectives, Increased damage mitigation rolls, moves awesome units such as Night Raptors or Pyroclast into the troop slot, and more. And in this instance, it comes up really wanting. Rather than an awesome drop assault lightning strike, it really works best when teamed with a group of snipers, who can use the preferred enemy rule to go character hunting with precision rending weapons. Yet another case of the Raven Guard having rules diametrically opposed to what it's supposed to be. Next we have... The Liberation Force. Now, the benefits it gives all Legionnaires of Stardis Raven Guard units in the army stubborn, but only once per battle. Your allied detachment permanently has the stubborn USR. As long as at least one model in a Legionnaires of Stardis Raven Guard unit is within six inches of an allied Imperial Army unit, the Marines gain hatred of everything. The limitations. You're not allowed to take any slow, heavy artillery, bombard, or automated artillery in the army. So, you know, that's a lot of the good things. It's also loyalists only, and it must be the primary detachment, and you must take an allied detachment of Solar Auxilia or Imperialis Militia, and the allied detachment must include at least four units. So, with the benefit of having hindsight, we know that neither the Solar Auxilia were written and playtested when this Rite of War was written, nor were the Militia, a twinkle in the eye of the demented crack whore who writes rules these days. So we see a real disconnect between the rules as intended and the rules as applied, and not for the umpteenth time this video. You cannot take slow, heavy artillery, bombard, yada 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 in there, which is bizarre, 
as you want things like cataphract terminators to balance out the poor stats and tendency of militia and solar auxilia to either flee or die, you know, vanish like a fart in the wind. As for artillery, why would you bring along those when you have factions who are there to use their artillery? That's their faction strong point. Well, okay, it was the faction strong point of the Imperial Army in the last edition, but in an edition where blasts or templates actually can work, well, it's most definitely not how I would describe this edition of the Horus Heresy. Additionally, you need to linger around the Allies for your bonuses, such as Hatred, but they both lack the speed to keep up with you, and they will fall down if so much as a stiff breeze hits, and you want them to dive into the heart of the enemy beside Dark Furies. The militia gains stubborn, which is neat, but then you have to remember that you take morale checks every time someone says the word Roxanne, and Roxanne. somebody put on the song in turn 1, and stubborn leadership 6 is still more likely to fail than pass. Fearless would have made a lot more sense here. So, both rights of war... suck. What do you do then? Well, my suggestion is, if you want to play Raven Guard, take the Recon Company Right of War. It suits you better than both of these and embodies the infiltration tactics better. And if you want to go the Assault Route with Jump Troops and such, then I would suggest either the Angel's Wrath or Drop Pod Assault Rights of War. All three of these Rights of War do Raven Guard ten times better than either of these so-called Rights of War. Now, Legion named characters. Firstly, we have Moritat Prime, Kytus Nix. Is the best Moritat in the world, or just a tribute? He has Stubborn, Sun Strike 1, Rampage 3, Shroud of 5+, Move Through Cover, Pathfinder. He's just got all these special rules. And he also gets three unique rules. Uh, Ill-Omened, which means he can never be a compulsory HQ, or Joint Squads other than Seeker or Mordathan. Which is odd, because he's a Moritat, and normally they join Destroyers, but... Okay, now he's a sniper or something. The Blood Crow makes him unaffected by any range modifiers, night fighting, shroud bombs, things like that. Um, not that any of his war gear can shoot those distances, but anyway. Uh, he always shoots his full ballistic skill, including snapshots uh, that make any model he shoots. Uh, may never make shrouded rolls to negate wounds inflicted by his shooting. Relentless Stalker allows him to be deployed in any area of terrain, regardless of position, or anywhere on the board, outside of 9 inches of enemies, if he isn't within area of terrain. If Nex enters the battle from reserves, he may enter from any board edge, but if he's in a unit, he instead gains the Scout and or Infiltrate rules, if the unit he joins already has them. Uh, he comes with two Fulcrum Hand Cannons, which each have a 24-inch and 12-inch profile, depends which ones you want to use, uh, and he also can use those pistols for melee. He also gets a Refractor Field, Melted Bombs, and Shroud Bombs. He has 12 pistol shots, uh, so he doesn't do Chain Fire like another Moritat would do, instead they've just got a fixed six shots each profile, which benefits really well from being attached to the Mordathan, because it will gain their special Rending 4 Plus rule. But since he's meant to be a lone killer, hyped up in that way, it's a really weird choice of rules. Still, he's really good on the tabletop and opens up some unique avenues, and I quite like him. Then, Strike Captain Alvarex Morn. Strike Captain Morn was a slightly toned down Praetor in 1.0, who traded stat line and weapons for amazing reserve manipulation and deep strike scatter placement. Which was a really unique thing, and it gave us a glimpse of some of the different character types that 30k could have outside of the usual sort, such as champions, psychers, apothecaries, and tech marines, you know, the ones you always see. Well, he was a guy who manipulated reserves, and what an interesting choice for Praetor equivalent. In classic 2.0 style, the writers felt that this should be represented by a barebones centurion with Master of the Legion, a unique warlord trait, a bolt pistol, a slightly better power saw with breaching 5 plus, and a motted Stratovox. He can take a drop pod or storm eagle as a dedicated transport, and his warlord trait lets him reroll fail reserve rolls for any deep strike that he is a part of, which is somehow worse than the regular deep strike right of uh, warlord trait that's available to the Legion. Somehow it's worse on the independent character. Anyway. Morn wears Artificer armor, but unlike literally every other Legion console, let alone Master of the Legion, he has no invulnerable save. 
at all, period. His Nightfall Pattern Stratovox allows him to reduce scatter by 5 inches, as long as the target point is within 12 inches of him, and any unit he joins ignores the minus 1 leadership penalty for night fighting. So you get a poor Master of Signals combined with losing your Praetor slot, as well as, well, paying a surprising amount of points for him. What could go wrong? Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, if you elect to actually use his Storm Eagle or Drop Pod dedicated transport, well, he loses his Infiltrate. Uh, and if here his unit lands within 8 inches of the enemy, then they lose the Shrouding too, meaning you have yet another model in the army who cannot use his Legion trait. And if you take him on foot to use it, then you just wasted all of his abilities. So just take a Warmonger console. Now, putting it all together, the Raven Guard can win games. Any Legion can win games. That said, the Raven Guard suck at winning games, unless you want to follow a very particular set of list construction rules, such as, now this is very complicated, you've got to bear with me, because there's a lot to write down here, so if you play Raven Guard, take notes. You just spam more day than Dark Furies and Deliverers. That's it, that's the gold at the end of the rainbow for the Raven Guard, and it leads to the most bland and boring armies you've ever cast your eyes upon. I've played seven games with the Raven Guard in 2.0 personally, where I have used the Raven Guard, and whilst it's not a lot, um, it has used a different force each time, because I wanted to really play with the Legion, try the different units out. I then went and shared my findings with other people for their feedback, and surprise, surprise, if they didn't agree with me on the Legion sucking and their games being miserable, it would usually turn out that, well... They followed the list construction rules I set out above, and they spammed the elite units. I'm sure there are a lot of you armchair generals out there right now who run tactical marines and drop pods and full of bolt guns and a Kratos battle tank, and you win every game you play with your Raven Guard. But you know what? I almost never see these people in real life, and almost never play against them. And when I have in Heresy 1, I usually wipe the floor with them. As it turned out, their extensive battlefield experience and non-stop wins... Yeah, it was usually down to them just playing some poor sod in their local gaming group who didn't know how to play, and they took advantage of it. You know the kind, the guy in the local group who bought the starter set and he has 40 tactical marines and 10 terminators, and then he goes against the Raven Guard player who has 30 Dark Furies, and just somehow the guy just wins every game. It's, <laughs> you know, you know exactly what I mean, right? I'd also like to use this opportunity to break script for a moment and point out that Every faction in the game has a blurb on them in the Siege of Cthonia rulebook from page 105 through to page 109, and the only Loyalist force left off it was the Raven Guard. In fact, all of the traitors were included, all of the Loyalists were included, the Sisters of Silence, the Legio Custodes, but not the Raven Guard. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're beloved by Games Workshop slash Forge World. Nothing says top of the line and well supported like being the only force forgotten in a book where they wrote a paragraph on the Sisters of Silence. Now, the Raven Guard are the second worst legion after the Thousand Sons. The Salamanders are not a great legion, but they have some great warlord traits, a fantastic right of war, and two top tier elite units. The Raven Guard have a Legion trait that applies to almost no units in their list. Warlord traits that are either useless or situational in the extreme. Elite units which gain nothing from their Legion traits and whom would work in any Legion just as well as they work in this Legion. A special character who has an identity crisis but is at least functional. A special character which has three roles but is somehow useless at four. Their best equipment boost their night fighting skills, but their legion trait encourages you to get so close that night fighting doesn't matter. Their legion unique weapon is a slightly more rending version of a weapon that every other legion has in common supply, and to top it off, their rights of war are busted for the worse. So a heartfelt congratulations from me to those who win games at the Raven Guard. I don't know how you're doing it, because I've been playing for, well, nigh on 30 years, was top 10 rankings in the country for competitive 40k once upon a time, and yet I cannot make them work outside of spamming Nemesis weapons or their elite units, neither of which is a testament to the strength of the Raven Guard, but merely a nod to how strong those weapons and units are. So how can I best summarize it? Well, I made this infographic to help you understand how this works.
Anyway, that's all for me. I'm Mac with the Outer Circle. I hope this gives you some insight into the Raven Guard. And remember, it's not all doom and gloom. They can win games. Just follow the golden rules of list building. I hope you wrote them down because they were very complex. And, uh, well, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. See you on the next one.